In this video, I would like to provide an overview of the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking. I would like to include a description of what the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking actually is, why it is useful, how it is conducted and measured, who is able to conduct the test, and what we can potentially learn from the test. So first, why is it called the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking? Well, it is named after an American psychologist called Ellis Paul Torrance. Torrance formalized the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking back in the 1960s. It was made by bringing together some of the work that he had previously done with elementary school children and others. He had a very large amount of experience working in the field of creativity. Torrance built upon the work of J.P. Guilford. Guilford has been credited by some as being the first to provide what we now think of as today as the standard definition of creativity. So this leads to the question, what actually is the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking? Well, in short, it is used as a way to measure a person's given creativity. The IQ test is used to measure a person's intelligence. In contrast, the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking is used to measure a person's creativity. It is important to realize that intelligence and creativity are quite different, and that they rely on dif different cognitive processes. Intelligence in terms of the IQ test primarily depends on having skills in what is called convergent thinking. In short, it relies on having the skills and knowledge to correctly answer a given question. Creativity, on the other hand, primarily depends on having skills in divergent thinking, which involves thinking of numerous, different and unobvious ways to resolve a problem. IQ tests can therefore provide what an intelligence quotient to see how a person's intelligence compares to a given population. The Torrance Test of Creative Thinking can provide a creativity quotient to see how a person's creativity compares to a given population. Now that we know what a Torrance Test of Creative Thinking is actually used for, we need to understand how it is actually carried out to measure a person's creativity. A Torrance Test of Creative Thinking comprises of several simple subtests or tasks which make up the overall test. The test materials comprise of two sections, both a verbal and a non-verbal, or sometimes called figural, section. One or more of these tasks can be used to measure either specific aspects of a person's creativity or to provide an overall comprehensive overview of that person's creativity. If a person completes a certain set of these tasks, a creativity quotient can be calculated from their performances in these given subtasks. Let's now spend a little bit of time to talk about these two sections, both the verbal and nonverbal, or sometimes called figural, sections. First, let's talk about the materials that are formed as part of the verbal section. There are generally seven verbal activities that comprise the verbal section. During each of the seven verbal activities, the person who is being assessed, the examinee, will be asked either one or several questions which are relevant to the activity of interest by the examiner. For example, during activity two, guessing causes, the person who is being assessed may be provided with a description of a certain situation. The person being assessed may then be asked to guess what may have been the cause which led to the currently described situation. Another example, during activity 5, the person being assessed may be provided with the name of a certain object and asked to come up with as many unusual uses for the object as they can. The verbal section is scored using three different metrics, which I will now describe. The first metric, fluency, is a count of the total number of understandable, meaningful, and relevant ideas that are generated in response to the stimulus provided by the assessor. The second category, flexibility, refers to the diversity of ideas that is generated. This, an off, this is often scored as the number of different categories that are used by the examinee in response to the stimulus provided by the assessor. The third category, originality, refers to how common the given response or responses are to the stimulus provided by the assessor. In other words, if the examinee provides a response which is statistically rare and not provided by many other people, the examinee will score higher in this category. We now move on to the second section of the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking. This section focuses on the figural or nonverbal, also sometimes called pictorial, activities. There are three main figural activities, 
picture construction, picture completion, and another one called lines and circles. During these activities, examinees will generally be provided with sheets of paper which contain some form of abstract or incomplete symbols or shapes. The examinee will then be asked to make amendments or additions to the symbols or shapes in order to create something meaningful. For example, in the picture completion task, an examinee may be provided with this shape, such as a triangle. They will then be asked to use the shape to draw a picture of which the provided shape is an important component. Another example, during the lines and circles activity, examinees might be may be provided with a sheet of paper containing 40 or more circles and asked to draw or sketch objects of which circles form a major component. This is especially useful for measuring fluency and flexibility to see how many and what variation the examinee is able to come up with. These activities are measured using five different metrics. The first two, fluency and flexibility, are the same as are used for the verbal components of the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking. The three new ones are elaboration, abstractness of titles, and resistance to premature closure. Elaboration can refer to the numbers and types of responses to the given stimulus, as well as the amount of detail given in the response and the level of imagination shown by the examinee. Abstractness of titles refers to the ability of the examinee to allow the viewer, in this case the examiner, to see the picture that they are coming up with more deeply and richly. In other words, the examinee has to capture the essence of the information that is involved and know what is important to the picture. Resistance to premature closure refers to the ability to demonstrate an openness of mind to allow for original ideas to take form and to take into consideration all forms of information that are available to the examinee at the provided time. Now that we have had a brief overview of the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking and how it is conducted, you may be wondering who actually can conduct a Torrance Test of Creative Thinking. Generally, a Torrance Test of Creative Thinking can only be conducted by a qualified psychologist who meets a required set of specialist criteria. It is not generally available to just anybody. So you may be thinking, if I want to have a go at doing this test, how can I access the material that is used by the psychologist to actually carry out the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking? Can I gain it freely somewhere? Generally, you can't. Official Torrance Test of Creative Thinking material is generally only provided to trained professionals who are capable of correctly carrying out the test, although there can be some general exceptions. You may be able to find some example questions that are contained within the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking online, though it is important to make sure that the source that you're using to find the examples is actually reliable. Another question that you may have regards the fact that the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking was formed in the 1960s. And does this mean that it is out of date? Is it actually useful these days? It is important to note that the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking is conducted tens of thousands of times each year in the United States of America on people of all ages. And this provides a lot of data which is useful because the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking is therefore under, able to undergo regular reviews and updates using this data. The Torrance Test of Creative Thinking has also been renormed five times in its history. This is required because the average creativity quotient can change over time in a given population. Renormalization allows the creativity quotient calculation to be adjusted to reflect the current population. For example, if the average value is, say, x in 1974, but that value is now x plus 5 in 1984, when it is renormalized, we can therefore change what we consider to be normal in 1984 so that it reflects the population of 1984 and not 1974. So you may wonder, what is the actual usefulness of a Torrance Test of Creative Thinking? Does it actually have a real-world application? Well, it does. It has good useful application because it allows us to consider how creative people are in respect to a given population and also enables us to compare different given populations. Some select entry schools all across the world use it in addition to an IQ test result as a way to measure a student's academic potential to try and decide which students they would like to enter their school. 
Longitudinal studies have also been conducted into the predictive abilities of the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking. Students' scores on the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking have been demonstrated to differentiate between those students who will go on later in life to be considered creative and those who will not. Therefore, if a student completes a Torrance Test of Creative Thinking late in their elementary school career or early in their high school career, this can be used as a reasonable predictor of whether they are likely to be creative later in their professional career. As previously mentioned, the test also allows the creativity of different populations to be compared. For example, one study found that American college students scored significantly higher than Japanese college students on the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking. Therefore, it may be considered that the creativity level of American college students may be higher than that of Japanese college students. However, it is also important to bear in mind that the Torrance test of creative thinking may not be equally applicable to people from different cultural backgrounds. Lastly, we may consider what else can we actually learn from the Torrance test of creative thinking. Well, it can actually be quite a lot, especially if we compare this to how we look at intelligence quotient results. It is widely known phenomenon that there has been a regular increase in the average IQ of people all around the world since the 1930s. This is commonly referred to as the Flynn effect, named after the person who documented this effect. So what about creativity? How has creativity changed in relation to intelligence quotient over time? Does it also change? Well, we have previously talked about the renormalization that has occurred five times in the history of the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking. If we look at how the test has been renormalized over time, we can gain an understanding of how creativity has also changed over this period of time. One study has actually investigated this very phenomenon and has noted that since 1990 to the period 2008, scores in creative thinking have overall significantly decreased, although IQ scores have risen during the same period of time. Fluency, originality, and elaboration all decreased during this time period. Some other metrics which form part of the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking have increased during this period, however. I hope that this video may have been useful to help you understand some of the basic principles of the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking, why it is useful, and how it can be used to gather knowledge about human society. Listed on this slide are the primary resources used throughout this presentation. Thank you for watching, and have a nice day.